you know, when people look at me, it's like, man, like, oh, you're a football player. And I just wanted to change that stigma. And I've been fighting that for years. You know, I'm more than an athlete. And just for the COVID to hit and to hit my family, I think it was just God's calling to just transition into something else. And yeah, like there was just so many things that was to me. And, you know, I didn't want to feel like I quit because I didn't, you know, I was just protecting my family first. And, you know, I think about it every single day, even today, like I miss the game, man. It's just, I think the game is always going to be a part of my life no matter what. And as I transition, as I get older, and just to teach the kids behind me, like, listen, don't let football use you and then leave you. Use football to bring you to different places. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And man, we're just not going to play around with today's episode. We're just going to go ahead and dive in. I was talking with my man offline, uh, and, and he said, he said, introduce him as, he said, introduce him as the Jiggy Haitian. So we have the Jiggy Haitian here in the building. He goes yes. by the name of Randy Paul. Man, R- Randy, talk to us, man. Just, just give the people a little snapshot on you uh, and, and just go ahead and bring this episode in, man. Oh, man, uh, who is the Jiggy Haitian? So, of course, if you can't understand, I'm Haitian, no, 100% Haitian. My parents are straight off the boat. So I am first-generation Haitian-American, and I wear that title of pride. That's my full identity. And Jiggy comes from when, my, when I was growing up. My brother used to make fun of me. Like, he's nine years older than me. He's like, man, you're a Jiggy dude. You're a Jiggy dude. Just trying to, like, poke fun at me. But as I grew older, I took that word, and I just morphed it into something that, that was for me. So being Jiggy is someone that, you know, to me at least, someone that people look up to. Like you are that person that people want to be like. So that's a Jiggy dude. Like he's popular. He's known. His lifestyle, people want to emulate. So that's something that, I, you know, the Jiggy Haitian, that's who I am, you know, from Long Island, New York. Uh, went to PWI High School, St. Anthony's High School. Uh, went to a PWI college, Marist College, played football there, and, you know, just tried to not be put into a box, you know, not trying to be looked at as just a football player. There's many facets to me, so I live I live that every single day to make sure people understand that when you think of Randy Paul, when you think of the deviation, it's, you know, you can't just say one thing about him. There's just so many things to him. So, yeah. Man, dope, dope. So, so Randy, I want you to talk just just a little bit of, of, about this because I I know me and you spoke like me and you spoke a couple of times over the past couple of months. We've been connected, man. Yes, but, but but you told me that, that that you said you you want you made a decision just to, to to walk away from the game of football, even though I mean the I know the pandemic and stuff happened, but you said even before that you said just some things shifted for you, some things changed, and, and you just said it, it was just time to do something different. So talk talk a little bit more about that, man. Why did you make that decision? Oh man, uh, probably it's, that's probably one of the hardest decisions because even to this day, man, I miss my team every single day. Like it, it kind of, it's kind of crazy that the pandemic kind of got in the way of the growth, but you know, God it has a mysterious ways of working because, you know, being from Long Island, being from New York and both of my parents catching COVID at the height of it, mm. you know, my father, he's one of the strongest people that I know and he catches it and he stayed on the bed for 10 days. Just, you know, his body was deteriorating. And, you know, my mother, she got the COVID SARS pneumonia. So but she wow. has, she was asymptomatic. So to me, I value my family more than anything. You know, my father, he has first stage prostate cancer. And, you know, my mother, she had a breast cancer scare. So to me, it was like, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I'm not going back to school. And if I catch COVID, then I have nowhere to go. I can't go back home because I could give it to my parents. But I can't stay in my house because I don't want to give it to my teammates so I was kind of in that rift Mm. and I decided that early on and it was kind of one of the toughest decisions that I've ever made because you know I played football almost all my life it was my you know it's a sport that I love this sport that got me into college made the best friendships it's brought me to so many different places and you know I'm not a small dude I'm 6'1 225 so 
Mm, you know, okay. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's just, <laughs> you know, but it's just like, you know, when people look at me, it's like, man, like, oh, you a football player. And I just wanted to change that stigma. And I've been fighting that for years. You know, I'm more than an athlete. And just for the COVID to hit and to hit my family, I think it was just God's calling to just transition into something else. And yeah, like there was just so many things that was to me. And, you know, I didn't want to feel like I quit because I didn't, you know, I was just protecting my family first. And, you know, I think about it every single day, even today, like, I miss the game, man. It's just, I think the game is always going to be a part of my life, no matter what. And as I transition, as I get older, and just to teach the kids behind me, like, listen, don't let football use you and then leave you. Use football to bring you to different places. And football has gotten me into so many different doors, man, and so many different connections. And football and sports is the language that I speak. You'd be surprised at how many things that I've been able to accomplish just because I played in college, you know and being a part of that process. Yeah, that's, yeah. I miss it every day though, man. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I think that's one of the things like about you, j just from like our conversations offline and uh, j just as we're, we're having this conversation, we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. Um, yeah. But I can I can tell that, that you're hungry. Like I can tell you're a hungry competitor. Um, I'm not just gonna say it's cause you're Haitian. I'm not just gonna say it, it's just, you know, you have a thirst for life. But earlier you, you're talking a little bit more about, you're talking a little bit about purpose um, before yeah. we hopped on. So 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 talk, talk a little bit more about like, about where, you know, like if, why, why are you so hungry and so so driven in regards to purpose? Like where'd this even come from? Oh man, uh, I wish I could say it's organic. I want I wanna say that it's, I did it, mm -hmm. but I'm a bold faced live. I say it's because of me, man. Like, just think about it. My grandfather came here in 1968. You know, my grandfather, he left his kids to be raised by other people for a better life. He thought 40 years ahead, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so I owe it to that man. You know, I owe it to him to create something to be more because without him making that initiative and getting citizenship and then giving his green cards to his kids and then my mother bringing my father and like just all these different th and my brother being able to come from the from haiti that makes me so hungry like my grandfather and for me i want to be an attorney so it's kind of crazy mm -hmm. my grandfather was in law school in haiti and he gave that up to go to america mm -hmm. so my why my drive doesn't it's not me because if it was just for me then any hard thing that I go through, I just quit because I have nothing to fight for if it's just for me. But my grandfather's 81 years old, 82 years old. And when I told him I wanted to go to law school, you know, he was just like, wow, like you're continuing what everything I've like, that's my drive right there. If it was for me, I wouldn't have done it. And then I know I have kids in my neighborhood that look up to me. Like that kid went to a private high school, went to college, like, he is about what he preaches. I'll never give advice to somebody that I wouldn't do, mm. you know? So my drive is just the people before me that has done it and couldn't do it. And the people behind me that's looking at me to do it. So that's my drive right there. Like, you know, I'm from a neighborhood, I'm from Huntington Station and it's, it's very diverse. It's amazing because it's literally the melting pot of the United States. And what does that mean? Like I'm around, you know, I can, I find successful black people. I'm around poor black people. I'm around successful white people. I'm around poor white people. Just the different types of mindsets. So, but my neighborhood is very, it's not segregated, but it's diverse for a reason. And as I look into local government and as I see different things in my neighborhood, it's like, wow, there's a lot of things that haven't been spoken on. So a person like me, I'm very brash. I'm a competitor, so I'm for purpose. So I'm the type of person, I may piss off a lot of people that have been in a position of power because what's driving me are those kids behind me that mm. won't get, you know, like being Haitian, like we've been raised where even if the system isn't for you, then get out of the system, do it yourself and then come back and fix the system. Mm. So that's my mindset. Like I went against the grain. So I'm back. And if it pisses anybody off, so be it. Because I got kids that I know want to be me or be better than me. 
don't have to go through the same trials and tribulations that I went through. So I'm trying to make it better for them by any means, literally by any means. So that's my, like my drive is impeccable. No one could outwork me because of that. Because if it was just for me, I'll stop at any time. I keep fighting for the people behind me and the people that were in front of me. Dang. And then, yeah. how, and, and then how, how old are you now, Randy? I'm 22. Dang. Ooh, that boy 22 and on fire. I love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, listen, man, we, we, we are working, man. It's, I'm, I'm here to really leave, like, put an imprint. By the time I have kids, man, like, by the time they're old enough, I want to be known as, yeah, my father really did that. Like, he created a path for us. I'm trying, you know, have you ever been around a lot of people that come from wealth where money is not an objective for them? They're just trying to figure out life. Mm. that's what I want to leave for my kids. I want them to just do anything. Like they play the sport, not because, ah, oh, man, like I got to, mm. it's the only way I could get out of the neighborhood is just playing a sport. It's like, no, like I love playing this sport and I'm gonna get out. And I'm gonna do it. Or like, I don't even want to go to college. I want to go and start or keep running my dad's companies. That's, that's the thing that keeps fueling me too. Is just like, I'm doing it. So I know when I'm a grand, when I'm 80 years old, Look what Grandpa did! Like he did all these great things. So, yeah. Dang, yeah. So, so with that being said, what are you working on now that's driving towards getting to that place? Oh man. Well, we got to start. Let's start back a couple months. Okay. So, back in March, we came home. You know, the George Floyd thing was just it shook America, man. So, one of my friends, we call him Snacks, he started organizing these marches. And I'm talking, he's, you know, we, I went to go support him, me and the homies, we went to go support him. And it was just crazy because we stopped traffic, we were marching, and we got some support, you know, the police department did protect us. But we had a, a owner of a restaurant, you know, he posted a video saying that Antifa's here and we should throw watermelons at them and call the savages and call this animals. So I personally knew this guy, you know, one of my best friends, his mom is very cool with this person, not anymore because it is everything, all these things that was transpiring, but they were very close. So when he posted that on, on Facebook, I responded like, listen, man, I know you. Like, I, I know you very well. We have mutual people. Like, I, we can have a conversation very quickly. And, you know, a lot of me and my friends, we got together like, you know what, how about this? If he says he's going to throw a watermelon, let's march to his restaurant with watermelons and see if he's really gonna throw it man news spread like wildfire it's a wildfire man we got you know so many people came out to support us politicians you know the inspector of the precinct uh legislators community organizers and just the youth man in about 12 hours we were able to organize 600 people mm. and we marched locked in arms down main street you know we shut down the town with support and even though there was a lot of politicians scared because you know around the country you you're seeing all these riots so you know a lot of politicians are telling uh, other politicians you're not going you're not going to support this initiative but you know what they felt inclined to support so we marched down there so you know i spoke and all these different things and then we wanted to do more. So, you know, the group, we, we got together and we started brainstorming. And then, you know, there was a lot of, this is where things kind of went left because I didn't realize this, but even if I did realize it, I, I don't know how I would have learned unless they're going through this. So there's a lot of people that were wolves in sheep clothing. So mm -hmm. a lot of people that look like us, that wanted to support us, but they had ulterior motives and different agendas. So I felt used. So, you know, they set up this big symposium at a nice house with a lot of politicians, with, a, with, a, with the police commissioner, with the, you know, the Suffolk County uh, district attorney, uh, legislators, the Suffolk County um, executive, all these, you know, state legislators, all these different people and to speak on change within my specific community, because I told you come from a diverse background, to mm -hmm. put into sense the average household income for my township is $110,000. But according to the census, the average black and brown household is $40,000. Wow. 
we're at a deficit. And, you know, we make up 15%. Black people make up 4% within the township. The rest is Hispanic folks. And we honestly thought we were trying to make some change. But there were some people within our group, you know, some advisors that worked for these municipalities. And we thought that they were supporting us. But after a couple months, we saw that it actually went left. And they, you know, they acted like, they were here to support the protest and support the change, but they actually were stifling us, mm-hmm. telling us not to be so vocal about what we are trying to do. You know, their biggest thing was have a seat at the table. But when we were at the table, the table wasn't for us because we're too brash. We're cha- People don't like change. People don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So they didn't like the way that we were th- thinking and the way that we were proposing. So honestly, a lot of these advisors that we started off with, they dropped us, used us for the photo ops, used us for the interviews, but now they're nowhere to be found. They didn't answer our phone calls. They just started doing their own thing. So now we're in the regroup of how do we get back to our original identity? So that's where we're at right now. And personally, I also started a nonprofit because being a former student athlete, I wanted to continue the game. and. I used football because I was inspired from the people in my neighborhood that went on to the next level to play football. Mm. So, but I'm from Long Island. Like I'm in the recruiting hotbed for soccer, lacrosse, and baseball. Like why, I think now, why can't I play lacrosse? Like if if I played lacrosse when I was five years old, I'd end up like at a Duke or UVA, not a Marist, no disrespect to my alma mater, but if we're talking, let's call it spade a spade. So I wanted to create something, well, not wanted to, I'm creating, called the Underdogs, where we provide resources for kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, hence my neighborhood, and we pay for these resources, have them be instructed by these great teams on Long Island for baseball, soccer, lacrosse, hockey, all these different initiatives. And at first, I went local. I I wanted to keep it as local as possible. I wanted to go around and I wanted to help out you know, don't reinvent the wheel, just help out things that's already in place. Mm-hmm. And the craziest thing happened to me that I never thought would happen to me. The same people that I was working with, they, but you, I got, the same people that I was working with took my idea and made it their own and cut me out. Mm. So, you know, they started their own initiative with each other, but they're missing a bunch of pieces because I wanted to, I wanted to scale this model. I didn't want to just do my neighborhood. I wanted to do nationally. If you are from Newark, New Jersey, you should be able to play lacrosse as well. There should be things in place to support that. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't, then I'm here to do it. But I wanted to start it in my own neighborhood. But you know, it's so crazy that as I was trying to build, people that were supposed to be my corner took it and ran with it and made it their own. So... You know, this was as of recently, this was today's Wednesday. This was as of Sunday, you know, I see it. People that I wanted to bring in, I'm talking about local leaders, skin, like, you know, skin folk, people that look like us. I've learned that not all skin folk is kin folk. Mm. Well, sadly, as I move up this, as I see how politics work, and when I say politics, I don't mean government only, politics and everything, just interaction, human interaction. There's a lot of people that look like us that don't want the change from the youth. And they say they do, but if it goes against what the older folks want, Mm. then those people that have the connection just drop you. So I specifically, you know, I keep it on the record. We are going to change. Change is going to come if it's uncomfortable or not. It's either you're going to join us or you're going to be the enemy. And since we talk about my drive and how I'm a competitor, I'm not the only one that has this drive. Mm. I'm the product of my environment. There's a bunch of people that are from my neighborhood that have this type of drive. I may be brash and I may speak on it, but they still have the same intention. So, you know, yeah. I'm very positive. You know, I'll, as of the last couple of days, I've just been going into my network because I told you my sport have, has brought on a lot of great connections. And there's a lot of things that I want to talk to you, especially off the record, because what I, how I just changed my entire business plan and the connection that I want to make is going to have a national impact, not just a local impact. So, like I say, when God closes one door, there's a window that's open. <laughs> Man, this window is wide open. And 
it's going to be amazing. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Like I just, I can't wait. And I'm actually grateful that this happened now when we were just starting all the true colors started mm. because now I'm going back to what I used to know. Only people that I do know go back to the network that I know that I could trust. And we're going to do it like this. I don't want no new politicians. I don't want no new community leaders because those are the people that took advantage of me. And when we speak on it, I'll just say it. The reason why I don't trust you guys is because of this person, this person, this person, they already messed up. So I can only go for people that have very good intentions to make the youth better because the youth is for tomorrow. I'm part of that. You know, there's kids that are nine, 10 years old that's looking at me that's that want that opportunity so by the time they turn 10 years old 11 years old i want that system in place so by the time they turn 18 they're going to duke they're going to unc they're going to stanford they're going to ivy they're going to those institutions that they can actually benefit from they don't have to go to the community college they don't have to take mm -hmm. this route they can go to a university they could go to hbcu and kill it mm -hmm. they can go to these different institutions because these things in place so I'm going to let these minor problems just roll off. You know, it's charges to the game. But they messed up because, listen, man, I, I'm a football player. <laughs> and I'm a DB. I'm a safety. You're going to mess up sometimes, but that's yesterday's paper. Like, we on to the next play. <laughs> you know, my intention, I'm very intentional with my decision. So I'm very grateful for how things are happening. So right now, the underdogs – what I have in place and how we, how I tell you the business plan off the record is going to be amazing. Like it, we, we got some things that's going to be insane. I, I'm very excited, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm really excited for you. And I, I was talking with, uh, I was talking with somebody the other day, just in athletics yeah. and, and, and we were just talking about your, your generation. Um, yeah. and, 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 and I'm, I'm not saying it negatively because I know a lot of times the generation before kind of like, you know, pours whatever on the other generation, like, oh, no, this generation wants this, or they're this, and they're that. I I'm not saying it in a negative way, but your generation, yeah. I feel, is probably one of the most purpose-driven generations. I also feel that this generation is, is one that, so, so my generation was the one they called entitled. My generation is the one that, you know, the millennial generation is what people were saying, well, we want this and we want that. But your generation, it's like, okay, you're telling me to do this, but at the same time, I want you to show me you doing what you're telling me to do, because it's, it's like, you know, time out for all that other stuff, because, you know, your generation has seen the country going highs. You've seen the country going lows. And now it's like, OK, well, I mean, I'm going to take a chance on what I believe in. But at the same time, it's going to be on my terms and I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. So that, that's why I really love your generation. I love yeah. how I was just rising Perfect. up. And I'm just trying to make sure I'm on the right side. So yeah. you know, that's why we stand connected. <laughs> and, and that's why, you know, all the, all the student athletes out there and everybody out there, I, I, I want everybody to know my stance. I'm, I'm riding with y'all, man. I'm trying to do yeah. everything I can to support uh, and to be an advocate in any way that I can. Uh, so, man, yeah. that, we, that we can really get the change that y'all that, that, that have been seeking, that, that we've been seeking. And ultimately, so that it can just continue to, to become a cycle for the generation behind and then behind. And then ultimately, man, we get to where we're going. Yeah, I mean, like, just I could speak on this. I'm working with somebody. Um, he has this foundation called Athlife. Athlife, you know, as a former student athlete, my athletic academic advisor, and I'm going to speak on it, Miss Gates, Alyssa, she is the most important person for my collegiate career. Mm. hands down i'm not it's not no coaches and i love my coaches coach cam you know i gotta shout him out but it's not my coaches it's my athletic academic advisor mm. she solely is the reason why number one i made this connection especially black professionals in the space because i was able to go to black student athlete summit down in austin texas i was able to meet those people and i love that place i i, I have brothers down there and working with athletes they, their mission is to bring athletic academic advisors to the high school level. Mm. That's their goal. Wow. Six, I've successfully, and I, you know, this is an announcement for everybody, successfully was voted on by the school board for the town of Huntington. Huntington Station, you know, the Huntington School District. They will have AthLife starting very soon. Mm. Having an athletic academic advisor. Basically, I like to refer back to Coach Carter. You know, Coach Carter was like, listen, it's either you have this GPA, you don't play, or we sit in a study hall together. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what it is. Hold everybody accountable because 
you might not have a bunch of D1 caliber players, but if you have everyone that's D1 qualified, that opens up doors for those kids to go to school at the D2, D3 level. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, that increases graduation rates. So that's another part that I'm, I'm fighting right now. And I received some resistance from people in my neighborhood when I brought that up. Some of the older generation, they thought these people were using us. I said, but how? I, play, I played in college, in the college environment. Yeah. I understood how important this person is. This person makes or breaks you in college. And then you could ask any, any student athlete, especially a football player or a basketball player, mm. that athletic academic advisor is the most important person within that facility because they are going to work with you to make sure you are qualified to play. So it's my job right now. I am trying to bring athletes into every single school district that I have to deal with, especially at the underdogs level. Honestly, right now, I'm trying to connect Poughkeepsie, where Marist is, to be a part of athletic. They have a 60% graduation rate. That's one of the goals that I have personally. The next goal is to have an athletic representative in all of the schools where my teammates, especially the black teammates, went. I got some teammates from Florida, Philly, Delaware, mm-hmm. the DMV, Ohio, Georgia. There, there are some places, they're from the hood, that they're the anomaly. I want to create that, I want to create the environment that they're not the anomaly. It's part of the system that they're a part of. So if you add an athletic academic advisor and everybody's good at football, because how many people do you know that went to high school that were really good but couldn't go because I don't have the grades, mm. I don't qualify, I go JUCO. Now it's they enter that system, they have an athletic academic advisor, and they are on top of that. And the graduation rates will increase. It's been proven. Mm. You know, so that's one of my goals. And I'm doing it completely free because I understand how important it is. I get nothing out of it but knowing that I get more black kids into college just mm-hmm. by adding that, advocating for that because I'm a student athlete. So I understand exactly what the purpose is for study hall. Listen, in college, hate study hall. Yeah. But, but it's a great thing because it makes you do what you got to do. And whatever contract you guys sign to what the GPA is to stay qualified, do that. It will prepare you for college. So that's one of the things that I'm working on. Like, you know. Yeah, and, and see, Randy, and what you said, so I, I heard what you said, but I even heard a little bit that you didn't say, because yeah. ultimately, I think, I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go here, and I'm, I'm going to say a generality, but people who look like us, like, we, we like flashy, like, we, we, we like getting active, we like being seen, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of times, that's that time where we're supposed to be in study hall and, you know, do, doing all that. But 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 this is doing the work that's behind the work. So yeah. going being in study hall, creating that level of discipline, that sets you up long term for success. Because if you become disciplined and learn, okay, well, as I've gone to study hall and I've been in here two hours, three hours, first of all, let me figure out how do I best learn or how do I need to be taught and then be able to identify that. That helps you become more disciplined because you and me both know when you get the best grade in the class, you excited, right? You ready yep. to show it off. You want, hey, they call your name. You're like, hey, look at me. I did this. So we get, we get the accolade, but ultimately it has to be a point to where we create successful habits. And a lot of us haven't, I didn't have those habits when I was in college. I don't know about you. You might, you might, you, you, you smart, Randy. So you might've had some of them habits, but I, I didn't have them habits until I started going to study hard, just like you said. And then when we get out, and then some of us want to be entrepreneurs. Some of us want to be business owners. Then we have the habit of managing our time. We have the habit of being focused and being disciplined, sitting in one spot. But man, yep. I mean, I, I think that's that's one of the things that needs to be said. And we have to understand people aren't putting you in study hall because they don't like you. They putting you in study hall so you can be successful long term. Of course. But that's another thing that coaches have to understand. Because there's a lot of old school coaches where oh, well, you're taking up my time for instruction. It's like, ah. But if you're instructing the kid and he's not going to be able to play at the next level because of his grades, how much mm. does it really matter if he's missing that instruction? No, he has to go sit and study hall. He has to get his grades up. Make that the front. That's the front piece. I don't care how good you are. You don't qualify. You're sitting. Mm. Because in college, I'm telling you, people don't realize when the NCAA say you are – you. Sorry, you're not. You're academically ineligible. Mm. 
The coach can't do anything. Nothing. You don't got no pull, coach. If you have, if you don't make, if you don't have the grades, you can't even come to practice. You could only go to school. So at the high school level, even at the high school level, for example, if you get a bad grade and the coach goes to the teacher for you and say, oh, can you move things around? You're not helping that kid in when he gets to college mm -hmm. because the coach will never, ever speak on behalf of you to your teacher. That is your responsibility. No mm -hmm. one's going to do it. If you don't talk to him, that's it. Talk to us. You, but you know, that's, these are the good habits that are supposed to happen. Man, and, 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 and I, I, hate, I hate to take it here, Randy, but I have to. I hate to take it here. I'm going to preface it by saying that, but I have to. But ultimately, discipline doesn't just apply in the classroom. And I, I hate to see the, the, the social injustice that's going on around the country. But let's just imagine for a moment. Let's just imagine for a moment that there was a child that was in middle school and he understood that when a teacher told him to sit down, he respected the teacher enough to sit down. And then he came into high school, and then there's a teacher that he respected. This teacher said, sit down. Then that gentleman sat down. So then let's fast forward life. This gentleman gets pulled over, and he's told to do this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not for any form of anyone beating on anybody. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for that. But then when it gets to a place and you're instructed to do something, and then you go against what you're instructed to do, that can create some problems. And I think that could potentially decrease some of what we've seen. Because on the other side, you know like I know, there's good cops, there's bad cops. But some, some instances happen. Yeah, I see what you're trying to say. Again. Some instances happen where some things take place because of what the individual did initially. Granted, there, there's a there's a lot of other there's a lot of other factors in the play. There's a lot of other factors in the play, but if some if somebody's pulled over and this individual this individual might be scared, we don't see that physically, right? This individual might be scared within, and at the same time, so about they, the cop or the, the I'm, I'm talking I'm talking about the cop. I'm talking about the cop because okay. both pe both people are probably scared. Let, let's I, I've been pulled over many times and I've been scared. The cop pulls me over. I say, yes, sir. No, sir. I'm hands on the wheel. What do you want me to do? I just do it. Every instance, like I said, there's a lot of factors into play. But I think that that could potentially decrease some things that we've seen here lately. Potentially. You want to know why? You want to, you want to know why I say I disagree? I'm, I'm, I'm open for it. I'm open for it. Let's, let's, let's because talk. that's like telling a victim to check themselves for getting abused. Right? Systematically. Let's, let's, let's just talk about this. Okay, no, no, no. Come on, I'm, I'm open for the conversation. See, let's just let's talk, talk about it, though. Let's talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk. As a cop, if you are scared of patrolling in the area that you're at, you should not be patrolling in that area because now you view that person as something that they're not. Perfect example. I'm from New York. If you live on Long Island, if you live in white suburbia. I suggest you not go to Brownsville in Brooklyn and go deal with folks because you're going to look at those black people as animals. So you're going to mm. treat them as such. That, that's, that's the fair. system. The system is messed up. You want to know why? Because especially at local police, they just have to take an exam. They, that's all they have to do is just take an exam and go to the academy. But if I want to be an FBI, if I want to go to the feds, I need at least a bachelor's degree. I'm going through years of training. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as I was scared. This and no. It eliminates a lot. What if we set the bar for police officers to get their degrees? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now it's gonna force those people to think very critically. Very critically. You don't have these problems in all these other areas. Now they have their own problems. Mm, that's a good point. That's a good but point. From, but if I'm an FBI agent and I have to deal with something, if I'm Homeland Security, I'm dealing with things very differently. Very differently. I have to think differently because there's a lot at stake. Mm. The system saves. I don't want to hear there's a lot of bad cops because the famous comedian did say, if you had a bad pilot, if you had a bad doctor, we're screwed. So you can't give me that. And as a system, I'm not even looking at, when we talk about cops, I'm not going to look at these lower tier cops. I'm not looking at these 
officers that's on the street, and I'm not looking at sergeants, I'm sorry. I'm looking at upper level management because all these people are just taking commands from the top. It's the top that needs more black people in there. That's number one. Number two, they need to understand that many people are different. You cannot be scared on the job. We need to change from the top down because if you change from the top, then the bottom is going to listen. A street level cop is not going to go against his commander. It's just not going to happen. He's not going against those orders. But then again, you can't even do that because you're forgetting a big piece, the PBA. And the PBA is fueling the entire engine. These unions are, they're not playing that. Mm. You know, so there's, when we talk about these different things, it's like there's a lot of, there's a lot of sides that people don't see. And it's not that easy. So when we just say, oh, well, if you just listen to the cop, it'll be great. Because uh, mm. even back to the teacher, if you're not prepared to understand that this child, he might have a problem with authority because whatever he goes through at home, he might need counseling, he might need extra help. So him, you just go sit down and he's combative. That doesn't mean the kid is bad. He might be going through something. So if you can't deal with certain types of kids, then I don't think you should be in that environment. True, true. And and see, so so I, I wasn't going a, as in depth, but if we if we went if we went there, then then yeah. Well, I mean, certainly if if you're a teacher then every child should be a case by case basis. And when I say case by case basis, you should get to know this child and you should, there should be relationship to where you're aware of what's going on and what's taking place. But just like, just like you said, I mean, there's a lot, there are so many different moving pieces. Oh yeah. There's a lot more that, that we don't see. And, and I was watching, uh, I was watching this show on Amazon. Uh, what, what, what's the show called? Oh, it, I, I think it's called the, the boys or something like that. And it's almost like, I don't want to call them off-brand superheroes, but if you see it, it looks like it's like a, a Superman and it, it looks like characters that we've seen before, but they're all together. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna make this really short, but ultimately th this guy who looks like Superman, he flies up to the plane. The plane is going down. Uh, it's like 135 people on there. And they say, well, are you gonna save all these people? And he's looking around. He's like, no, that'd be too many trips for me. I don't want to do that. And then he jumped off the plane. And this is a dude who's a super, Randy, he's a superhero. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, if that's how he's thinking, I would hate to see what some other people are thinking in some other positions. So that really messed up my mind. And of course, this is a show. So just, just I mean, just, just bringing it full circle. I, I, I know that that's not my calling to be in that space. But, but like you said, you know, you, you're striving and you're going to become an attorney. So, man, however I can support you in that, my brother, please, please I mean, let, let me know. Please let me I'm, know. I'm trying to go into sports and entertainment because I can't go into criminal personally. Well, hey, I mean, that, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's fair. But, but you having, you having that, that, that brotherhood and being in that fraternity yeah, of being of an attorney, you're gonna, you know, you, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna brush shoulders and you're gonna meet uh, different. I mean, it's just a who, scary thing. Like personally, like you know, I had experience in the in legal aid society, so I was in the New York Supreme Court on Long Island, and I seen guys that look just like me like i said there's no black attorneys there's no black judges no black bailiffs no black officers nothing just black people going to jail and every single day i seen brothers going to jail for three years life 20 years 15 years seven years i i personally can't do it i can't even do it for a check i'm sorry i can't it's draining for me it may sound selfish i'm gonna try to help the people and black people from the other spectrum try to do preventative because once you're there man it's it's a very uphill battle and i'm a you know i'm a support but i, I personally for my mental health I, i'm not gonna do it yeah I, I mean that's why i love what you, you're doing what you're doing though because uh like, like i mean like like you really talked about um just just, just a little bit and just knowing you know no, knowing what, what you're doing uh, ultimately with you know with with the underdogs and some of the other things you're doing you're educating because i believe the only way true change is going to happen is through education i'm not necessarily talking about through the form of academia but getting educated and then the other part is economic because if we don't have no if you don't have no money you're not making no change for nobody i'm sorry people can say what they want to say but if you don't have education and you don't you're not playing a role in that in that economy 
I mean, like I said, oh man, just you're gonna un, un, you're gonna uncover a can of worms, especially where I'm from, because I told you we're worth forty thousand dollars. So it's easy to build and gentrify my neighborhood because we're poor. Mm. A lot of people in my neighborhood are immigrants, so they're really focused on making enough money to go take care of their family. They don't know these politics. They don't know any of these things. So you have a lot of people, especially that looks like us, that's not informing us on what's going on. They just see construction, and they don't realize that if a one-bedroom costs $2,500, that drives your rent up. Mm. And in a couple of years, you can't afford that. When you start seeing yoga studios and coffee shops, uh. but like I said, people wouldn't know that unless you take the time and you read the budget, you read the executive summary. There's a lot of things that's going on in my neighborhood. It's just like, you know, it's scary. It's, I'm, I'm, you know, it's very scary and I'm very blessed that my parents, my, you know, my father, my parents divorced, so my father, his brother, his cousins, they all have property within the neighborhood mm. because at the end of the day, God forbid they pass, like I get them. I have a say, I pay taxes, you know? Like I can count off my, off my hands, seven houses, ten thousand dollars a year in taxes. Like you have a say in this community of what goes on. I want to tell more black folks that listen, like we need to start dumping money into our own neighborhood. No one's coming to save us at all. We gotta fix ourselves and then we can fix the system. That's why I got one of my friends, you know, he's big into politics. I let him do the politic route, the political routes. I can't do it. I'm too brash. You know, a lot of people tell me, a lot of people tell me, man, ah, oh, man, a lot of people want to hear you because you just, you talk a lot of stuff. I said, you know what? Maybe that table's not made for me because I've gotten this far and all, all the connections that I've made because I'm authentic. I'm literally authentic. Like, there's nothing fake about me. I say what's on my mind. I, of course, I give respect to everybody, but I just don't allow things that are inorganic and ingenuine around me. You know, either God removes them from my life or I remove myself. Mm. And I think, I mean, I think that's a, a big piece uh, because one, I think you're just a disruptor by nature, but I mean that in the most positive way. The safety, um, man. What? <laughs> you see, it, it all comes back full circle. Oh, that, 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 that does go full circle. You, you break up the big play, you know? Yeah, you're funny. Uh, yeah, man, because, uh, because ultimately... The, the, the thing that, that happens in society and in America as a whole, each and every one of us, I don't know what the individual particularly needs, but everybody listening to the podcast right now, there is something that you need. It might be money. It might be security. It might be whatever. And then once you hit that plateau, you're comfortable. So you're not necessarily worried about, oh, what about next year? Oh, what about five years from now? Oh, what about legacy? Because I'm comfortable. So I've plateaued, but that's why you're so relevant and so pivotal, Randy, because being a disruptor, you're like, hey, hey, shaking it up. I, I know you've got this, but we've still got work to do. I know you've hit this goal, but how can we now show other people how to get to where you've got so that all of us can ultimately yeah. elevate? So, yeah, man. Oh. <sighs> Man, but there's a, there, there's definitely a lot of work that, that that still can be done, and I definitely know that. Just using sport as the driver has helped me a lot, and I want people to understand that to use your sport, like literally, that that's something that helps me, and the people that have that identity as a student athlete that can help them, because. Your, if your dream is the, is the league, listen, I support you 100%. 100%. I'm never a hater. I just knew early on I didn't want to do it. Ever. Ever. Like, you know, you know, God willing, like, you know, who knows? But I knew my purpose was just, you know, just putting on for everybody. You know, putting on for everybody. And as I, you know, transition into figuring out what I want to do with my life, you know, the mantra, hey, you know, unity makes strength. So that's, that's what I'm on, man. Like, I'm very collaborative. It's not just me, it's we. So I'm just, you know, I'm pushing the needle, man. That's, that's, yeah, I'm pushing the needle. 
Yeah, man. I, 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 I definitely love it. And like, like I told you before, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you push that needle forward, man. I'm, I'm definitely, sure. de- de- definitely going to help you. Um, Thank you. But, but now, man, I want to want to take a slight slight transition. I, I know we we had this is a good this is a good conversation. I enjoyed yeah. this conversation, man. This is this is a good conversation. Um, but but now 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 I want to uh, just just take this this slight pivot and want to want to run you through. You know, you you're a football player. You know the the two minute drill. And uh and, and just just the two minute drill. Uh, it's just where we're gonna do a few rapid fire questions. I got got some questions for you. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun. Then after that, you let people know where they can find you, and then we're gonna wrap it up, put a bow on it, and then and say we out of here. Yeah, then then we out of here, man. You out of here. So are you ready? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Most underrated cereal. Who? Honey bunches. Oh, okay, okay. Your your uh, Netflix quarantine show of preference. Oh my. Yeah. Grey's Anatomy. It's not an original, but Grey's Anatomy. I'll okay, that's that. fair. Yeah, yeah. Favorite food. Jerk chicken, rasta right. pasta. Ooh, yes. Oh, okay, okay. The, the the last book you read? Last book I read. Oh my gosh, hold on. It's sitting right here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My favorite book, The Pact. I wish everybody could read that. Oh, uh, autobiography of a uh, French Douglas. Uh, okay, okay. And then the the, uh, the last question is one tip that you would leave for a student athlete. Oh man, be intentional. Um, prepare that tomorrow's your last day, like on the field. Um, pre- start preparing your life for life after your sport, day one. I don't care if you project yourself to have a 20 year career in the league or you're done torn ACL second year of, at college. As a student athlete, please prepare for what's next. And when that comes, you're able to just hop off that train and keep it moving. Mm. Okay. Intentional. Man, yes, there it is. There it is. And then, and then one, one, yeah. one, one, one bonus question. I got a bonus question for you. Okay. Who, who, who is the next guest that I should that you want me to interview on the on the Beyond the Ball podcast? The next guest. Oh man. Oh man. Who? Oh my big bro. Two, two of them. Trevor Costin and Afani Moma. Um, Afani Moma played in the league. Played for the Eagles. Oh, played for the Eagles and the Cardinals, but he had a good life in, in the Cardinals, worked for the NFLPA. Um, now he's going to law school. And then my big bro, Trev, he played for the Lions and the Bears, and he's the coach, the DB coach at Kobe College, All-American at the University of Maine. Those two guys automatically, like, I'm me because of them. You know? Dope, dope, dope. Well, yeah. you, you're going gonna to gonna have to connect me. You're going to have to connect me. I got you. Listen, they got a story to tell as well. And they're, they're pushing the needle. Sounds good. Sounds good. Now, now go ahead, Randy. Let let people know where they can find you and how they can connect with you. Uh, going oh forward. man, uh, Instagram, the Jiggy Haitian, uh, Twitter, R Paul O eight, and yeah, you know, just reach me on those platforms. See the journey. Uh, yeah, I'm just that's it. There it is. There it is. Well, my my man, I, I appreciate you stopping by, t- taking this time to you know to hang out with us on the oh, Beyond yeah. the Ball podcast. Yes, and sir. For, for all the ballers out there, uh, if you have not subscribed, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. Leave a helpful review. We will hope it's a five-star one. Uh, and then until next time, my friends, we're, this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree. I'm Jonathan Jones, and we're out. God bless. <laughs>